How are you guys? Incredible. Uh, welcome our panelists. This is uh, Dan Steiner, Victoria Robinson, and Josh Chumley. Have a seat, guys. Well, wasn't uh, yesterday incredible? Uh, I'm, I'm actually not going to open up by ripping Charlie for five minutes like Eric did, but um, uh, Charlie and I are actually brothers. Um, I'm just kidding, so. well, w uh, welcome, pastors. Good to be with you guys. Uh, this is the pro-life panel. These are some of the most incredible pro-life leaders that I know in the country, uh, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves in just a minute. But I want to ask you guys a question. Do you believe God still intervenes in the affairs of men? Um, and, I, and I'm so grateful that Charlie included his comments about Roe yesterday. It, it's incredibly powerful. I mean, we've been praying and asking God to rend the heavens and to pour down His Spirit and to bring revival and to tear down the high places and to overturn wicked doctrines of demons. And then when He did it, hardly any pastor said thank you from the pulpit. I mean, this is a, this is a Kairos moment. And the thing about a Kairos moment is that, like, most people don't know they're living in a Kairos moment until their grandchildren curse their names for their silence during that Kairos moment. Most people don't know they're living in one. Like, not all moments in time are created equal. Some moments in time actually carry more weight. We all think that me and Her you and Harriet Tubman, oh, you would have been like this. You would have been underground railroading it so hard. Um, but the litmus test as to whether you would have engaged these injustices that we all think we would have engaged is the degree to which you walk out of your cave and start tearing down the Asherah poles and the Baal statues today. So just to frame the Kairos nature of the moment that we're in right now, when Roe v. Wade got overturned on June 24, 2022, did you know in the church calendar it was the nativity of St. John the Baptist? Now, you know, the, <laughs> the Catholics are like, yeah, I know. And the Protestants were like, the what? Like, can we just be honest, Protestant pastors, we suck at the church calendar and Christian festivals and liturgies. It's when we celebrate Mary going to visit her cousin Elizabeth is the day Roe v. Wade gets overturned. It was the nativity of St. John the Baptist. So you've got the prenatal deity, second member of the Trinity, who once breathed out the Milky Way and is now a fetus, knitting the prenatal John the Baptist together in the womb because God is fully God and fully human, not from the moment of birth. Jesus is fully God and fully human from the moment of conception. So that is the second member of the Trinity in the womb, follow the science, Fauci, which means that the prenatal deity, second member of the Trinity, is knitting the prenatal John the Baptist together in the womb in the same room while their mothers visit. But because that's the prenatal deity, second member of the Trinity, who once breathes out the Milky Way and has created every human being, he's knitting himself together in the womb while he knits himself together in the womb of a woman whose uterus he once knit together when he knit together Mary in the womb of Mary's mother. That's called the incarnation. That's called Christianity. Of all the days Roe could have gotten overturned, are you freaking kidding me? What a coink -a dink And then there was a planetary alignment in the night sky, nine hours after Roe v. Wade got overturned. Now, Pastor, I'm not telling your congreg congregants to go read the stars, okay? Jesus said it's a wicked generation that seeks for signs and wonders. Amen. But there was five planets lined up in the night sky in a rare planetary alignment. And then a photo went viral of this planetary alignment across the, all the interwebs. And uh, <laughs> the name of the photographer who took the viral photo of a planetary alignment the evening that Roe v. Wade got overturned, his name was Wright Dobbs. The last name spelled D-O-B-B-S. Anyone know the name of the Supreme Court decision that overturned Roe v. Wade that morning? It was Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And the photographer's first name was Wright, like they were right in the ruling of Dobbs this morning. So just to tell you the Kairos moment that you're living in right now, God still intervenes in the affairs of men, and it would do us well to join him on the field of battle. So give glory to God. Incredible. All right, here are our panelists. I want them to introduce themselves right now. You guys got all mics. This is Dan Steiner, Victoria Robinson, Josh Chumley. Tell us who you are, guys, the name of your ministry, and what you're doing to fight for life. Uh, Dan Steiner, Chief Cook and Bottle Washer of Preborn Ministries, and uh, we are the competition to Planned Parenthood, saving 200 babies every day. 200 babies every day. Online, saving babies. Uh, Victoria Robinson, founder and CEO of Reassemble. We are bringing the men and women who have been traumatized from the trauma of choosing abortion into healing and reminding them that God died for them too. That's right. That's right. Beautiful. Yeah, Josh Chumley, Choices Pregnancy Centers. We are the largest pregnancy center network in Arizona and one of the largest in the nation. Been around since 1983. We've seen, seen 10,000 babies saved since that right. time, and thousands come to know Jesus Christ. Come on. That's right. So one of the things that happened when, when Roe got overturned, right, and the, um, the secular religion and the, the high priest of humanism started manifesting their inner transgender legions when, when the high places started tumbling on June 24, 2022, was this uh, overt attack against pregnancy resource centers. Did anyone notice this? <laughs> you got Elizabeth, uh, Indian warlord uh, Warren, 
um, saying that uh, co-sponsoring legislation to label pregnancy centers the dangerous spreaders of misinformation. You guys remember this? We don't want women walking into those centers. We don't want them to see an ultrasound. We don't want them to see their babies. We don't want them to hear the risks of abortion. And then there were like some pregnancy centers attacked or something around the country, one or two or a hundred or something like that. Uh, Josh, can you talk about kind of this moment that we're in, the, the significance of pregnancy resource centers at the local level, and what an easy way for the church to engage with ministries already on the ground in their own, in their own uh, cities? Yeah, the threats definitely came, and they continue. We had Antifa tweeting out all of our pregnancy center locations and calling for Jane's nightmare, uh, you know, the, the announcement of, of Roe versus Wade being overturned. Thank God we did not have any serious attacks like we saw with the burning down of pregnancy centers. So if we're not a threat, why do they need to burn it down? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to spread the gospel. We're going to save lives, and they don't want that to happen. But it's not just these threats of burning things down. It's what's happening online. So there's a website called fakeclinics.com, and they have all the pregnancy centers out there listed to basically say, hey, will you post a bunch of Google reviews that aren't true to stop women from going to these clinics? So they're, they're definitely smart, but we have a bigger God than big tech. And Google is complicit because they will, they put in algorithms where you can't find pregnancy centers now. Before last June, and there was, uh, let's call it 45 Democrats that sent a letter to the CEO. That's right. Talk about that. And so after that time, it's been much more difficult for women to find us when they type in abortion. We don't pop up. And that's very, very unfortunate because we're providing real health care. We are providing the gospel. And we're providing care that they've never experienced before. And we have testimony after testimony of that happening every single day. Yeah. Amen. And, and Josh, so I, I was the son of a pregnancy resource center director. My, my mother was directing a center uh, down the street from Azusa Pacific University in the early 90s. So I've been a pro-life activist since I was a fetus. So I've been around the pregnancy center space for a long time. But I've never seen this level of hatred, vitriol, and just unapologetic violence and threats coming against pregnancy centers. I mean, these people literally hate you. They do not want pregnant women to walk in. Uh, the, the, the abortion industry hates women almost as much as their preborn child because they profit off of dehumanizing both of them. And so, like, for, for pastors and, and churches in localities all around the country, what would it look like and what can churches do if they were to engage heavily financially, volunteer-wise, with the centers that are already fighting for life on the ground? What would that, like, paint us a picture of what it would look like if every pastor and church in, in, at the summit today engaged heavily and significantly with their local pregnancy resource center? Well, Choices is in Arizona. There's over 3,000 pregnancy centers in the country, and we outweigh Planned Parenthood three to one. Yeah, that's right. So when the church engages, things change because you are acting on behalf of God Almighty. And so when we see churches actually get a hold of this and they support financially or volunteers, really the, the, the biggest win is when we have a church actually want to do ministry with us. We call that the bridge program. Good. Let's not just treat them at the pregnancy center. Let's get them into community with mentors at the local church because that's the game changer. Come on, we cannot be, like Jesus says in Revelation, like the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans, do you know why he says that? You, this is a room full of pastors. He said he hates the Nicolaitans because Nick, Nikolai, he actually blended paganism with Christianity. That is happening in the American church today. And so when the church actually stands for truth, lives are saved, lives are changed, and you need to get involved with your pregnancy resource center. That's why I'm up here with TP Faith. We created a resource together, tpfaith.com slash choices that helps you understand how you can engage as a, as a local church with a local pregnancy center. This is not a political issue. This is a heart issue. And we are here to see a woman's heart restored while saving a heartbeat. Wow. And I, I want to say this about Josh, because again, I've, you know, I've been around this space for a really long time. Um, I, I've rarely met a more bold pregnancy resource center director actually in the country. And I've been keynoting these galas for pregnancy centers since I was like 22. Um, most pre some pregnancy center directors, they want to avoid the political battle, right? Because they're going to get in the hot water and they don't want Planned Parenthood putting their crosshairs over their ministry. But Josh here is so vocal against the threats coming against pregnancy centers because if the left is successful in what they want to do with pregnancy resource centers, they won't exist or have an impact anymore. So I want to challenge you as pastors and churches, 
don't just go to your annual gala for your pregnancy center. That's like bare, bare bones. Like, do what he said and actually engage as a ministry partner with these local centers who are saving children is almost the last line of defense. So thank you, Josh, for what you do. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that pastors have said for a long time, and I, and I hope no pastor at this summit would say this anymore because you seem all pretty like Holy Spirit red pill, amen. But um, what I heard for a long time when I was trying to speak in churches was, well, Seth, we don't talk about that because we don't want to shame or condemn any of the post-abortion men and women in our congregation. So we're just going to preach the gospel, and, uh, and then, you know, if they bring it up, if they come to me, I guess, you know, we'll talk about it, but I'm not going to do that from the pulpit. I'm not going to preach against the high places, because then I might make them feel really bad for their sin. It's like, well, well then what's the gospel? Um, and so Victoria and I have been friends for years, and what, she's incredible, because she has a post-abortion uh, story, and yet healed and redeemed, she's now leading hundreds of men and women who sometimes have not told anyone... For decades. And then she's there to help pick up the pieces to reassemble their lives. So, Victoria, talk about how much Satan has a foothold in the American church, stunting spiritual growth and discipleship because pastors won't address the fact that they have men and women in their congregation who have helped kill their children and they won't bring the truth and the healing. Talk about how God's used you and what you're doing at Reassemble. Well, thank you for being here, and thank you, TP Faith, for having me. Um, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart because I am a post-abortive woman, 37 years now. And I walked around for 10 years thinking God hated me, that he could never use me, that he could never forgive me. And then I found Jesus in 1993, and I knew God forgave me for my sins, except that was the one sin I was convinced he could never forgive me for. So until I found abortion recovery healing through a pregnancy resource center in North Carolina, I know how these men and women feel that are sitting in your churches week after week, Pastor. I went to a church because I was looking for the answer. I heard God was the answer. I heard Jesus was the answer for all the, way, the ways that I fell. And, and they never mentioned it. I never heard about it. So what a man or woman does that is post-abortive like I was is we internalize that to believe my own pastor won't discuss abortion because he even knows that's the one sin God could not forgive me for. Wow. So pastors, those men and women are sitting week after week looking at you as their spiritual guidance of letting them know Jesus forgives all sin including abortion, and he can redeem your life. Because the last time I read the Bible this morning, the Jesus I serve died on the cross not only for my aborted children and for the millions of aborted children since Roe v. Wade and before. He died for me too. So these moms and dads need to know the truth. So what we do at Reassemble is something that I've been doing for 27 years now. When I went through the abortion recovery, I sat there on that Thursday. It's a Thursday to a Sunday retreat. It's a very intense retreat. But the Bible study is specifically fo focused on abortion recovery. And I sat there, I'll remember, on Thursday in Greenville, South Carolina, and I looked at the two women that were facilitating, and I sat back with my Italian bad attitude. And I said, I don't even know why I'm here. This is stupid. I've been begging God for 10 years to heal me of the regret and the remorse and the feelings I have of unworthiness that he could never, ever look at me or want to use me or love me again. And you're telling me in three and a half days you're going to help me. And then they just said, well, Victoria, we're just so happy you're here. And then I wanted to punch them. <laughs> On Sunday, when that retreat was over, I hugged those women, Trina and Carolyn, and I said, every woman who's had an abortion needs to know God loves them, that God can heal them, that he can redeem them. And then I pushed men aside like the world does, as we do when it comes to this issue. We emasculate men because the abortion industry, which is a multi-billion dollar industry, my friends, emasculates men to the point where they tell them, shut up, it's not your body, so you have no choice. Well, it's not her body either. 
So men don't know what to say anymore. So the men sitting in your churches that are post-abortive think, I'm not supposed to be upset about this. I talked her into it. I paid for it. I made her do it. I didn't know. I begged her not to. Whatever the case is, they're not speaking out because they're not healed either. So the Lord started leading me to men's recovery. And two weeks ago, I did the very first in 27 years men's abortion recovery retreat. Wow. And these men were set free. And now they're ready to be a voice, to step up and say, I want to tell you, I've been where you've been. I know how you feel. I felt the same way. But let me tell you what I found out. Abortion is never the answer, but Jesus loves you. So let's get you the help you need. Wow. Wow. Uh, Guttmacher Institute, Planned Parenthood Statistical Research Branch, named after Alan Guttmacher, who took over as the president of Planned Parenthood when Margaret Sanger went to the deepest depths of hell. Um, They have done research on why uh, reasons U.S. women choose abortions. And I've gone through the reasons reported of why women choose abortions. It's fascinating. You look at the common denominators, it's things like uh, had relationship problems, couldn't provide for dependence, all these things. And you realize, oh, the common denominator is there's a lack of a strong masculine support there. And so the abortion industry knows this, and this is why they silence men for so long. So what would it look like to bring freedom and healing to your congregations of the post-abortive men and women that Satan has a foothold in that's preventing the kind of breakthrough and spiritual discipleship that you need at your congregation because they still tell themselves God can't forgive them? So it's Victoria, reassemblelife.com, reassemble. Thank you so much. So, uh, Dan, my goodness, um, Roe v. Wade got overturned and the abortion industry was ready. They were ready and they had been planning for decades to be able to take the medication abortion pill through the snail mail as the new alternative to killing babies. Uh, the whole landscape has changed now, brother. It's completely changed. Can you help us understand where this is going, the threats that are coming, the dangers of what's being pushed, and what do we need to know to be prepared to love on families and to save these children whose abortions are showing up in mailboxes? Yeah, so at the turn of Roe versus Wade last year on June 24th, the checkerboard was knocked over, and the whole abortion profile has changed in America for the worse. Uh, Group Mocker, he just mentioned, which is they're authoritative because they're the killers actually said there were 60,000 more abortions in the past year than there was before the overturn of Roe versus Wade. Now, how can that be? Well, number one, they put over 16 abortion clinics and mobile units right outside of pro-life states for abortion trafficking. But to more clearly convey what's going on here to your heart and to your congregation, let me talk about Maria, a real story. Maria was a millennial in a pro-life state. She couldn't get an abortion because she was uh, beyond the point where she could uh, get an abortion by the laws of the state. And so what did she do? Well, she went where she goes every place. She's a digital native to the Internet where she has her friends, where she gets everything delivered to her house. And she ordered the deadly abortion concoction, RU-46, prostaglandin, and progesterone, had it delivered to her mailbox. And one morning when her parents were gone, she took it, and it worked. After hours of bloody trauma, she delivered her baby dead on her bathroom floor with all the biological accoutrements to accompany it. Now, what's she going to do with that? She's going to flush it? She's going to throw it in the trash? Or she wrapped it in a washcloth and brought it to one of our clinics and tra- traumatized our, our people at our clinics, too. This is happening today in your neighborhood. Yep. The abortion clinic of today is your neighborhood girl's bathroom and tomorrow. Yep. And college campuses? Yep. They're putting abortion pill, little uh, vending machines? Yeah. It's crazy. The abortion clinics... Of, of today is our neighborhood, and they, it's over 50% of abortions now are chemical. They're not going into abortion clinics. They're not going into pregnancy yep. clinics. 58% are the last statistics. 58% of the babies killed in America in the land of the free and the home of the brave right now, not surgical. It's a pill. How much should they want it to be? 100%. So now they don't have to pay for brick-and-mortar abortion centers. They don't have to pay the lease on the buildings. They don't have to pay the abortion yep. staff. They don't have to fly late from abortionists around the country because a lot of people don't want to kill babies that late. Shocker. Um, and they've eliminated the need for the third-party vendors who come and take away the, uh, the limbs and the body parts of children if they don't sell them to interested third parties. And Kamala Harris covers up the investigation of Planned Parenthood. Um, they don't, they've now eliminated all those costs. 
So they can now roll out a cheap-to-manufacture, sell-at-high-margins abortion pill, which, by the way, is a Nazi-era relic, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. Um, RU486 is the name of the abortion pill. Do you know what RU stands for? Roussel Ukloff, the French manufacturer who invented the abortion pill and then Bill Clinton brought it to America in 2000. <laughs> Shocker. Uh, Roussel Ukloff has a majority shareholder named Hookst AG. Hookst AG emerged from the breakup of a German chemical company known as IG Farben. IG Farben was infamous for creating a cyanide gas known as Zyklon B. The gas used to poison Jews in Nazi death camps. So Hookst AG, the same freaking company, simply moved from creating poison to murder Jews to creating poison to murder babies. The same company, welcome to the culture of death, and it's showing up in little girls' mailboxes on college campuses. And thanks to the Biden administration, you don't have to have an in-person evaluation with a physician before getting the deadly pills. Yeah, and there's so plenty of websites, them. Seth, that actually tell you how to get around the local laws yep. to get it Say in. Say that again. There's, there's websites like, I'll just give you some of them. Plan C is the leading provider. A Buzz Healthcare is a spinoff of that. So we had a girl come in yesterday, and she had taken the abortion pill. She went to a Buzz Healthcare. And in the, that website, it seems criminal, but it tells them how to circumvent the laws in each state and confidentially receive this death medication at home, traumatizing her. Remember, she's taking it herself, so she's got the trauma behind that. And it's being sent out all over the country. So laws, whatever, they don't care, and they're putting it out for the public to see. Now, the great news for us at the pregnancy center level, there is a reversal for the abortion pill. If we yep. can get to her within 72 hours of that first pill, which happened yesterday, yep. a 10-week-old baby was saved yesterday. Praise God. Amazing. So there is, there is life. We call that the resurrection story. Resurrected life in that girl's womb. But she goes, yeah, the site looked a little, little shady online, <laughs> but I went ahead and got it. It's not legal in Arizona, but I took it anyway. And that's what these pregnancy centers and things like what you're doing is getting the word out. So, Dan, what is Mission Preborn doing on this front? So we are um, – so the pregnancy clinic like Josh is running, that's your Jerusalem in your missions budget. You need to profoundly fund these guys. Yep. But over half of them now are on the Internet, and so that's your Judea for your missions budget. Preborn wow. saved 54,000 babies last year. We've saved over 40,000 babies this year. And over, more importantly, 9,800 women have come to Christ, and they need to come into your church. And so I'm encouraging Wow. Yeah, they need the church. So we're encouraging you to go to preborn.com slash church, preborn.com slash church, and drive your stake in the ground saying, I am going to be a pro-life church. I'll take women that have received Christ. I'll teach about post-abortion with uh, Reassemble. I will um, fund my pregnancy clinic. And we can send women to you that we reach on the Internet. We need your help. Preborn.com slash church. Wow. Friends, this is no time for a therapeutically oriented, entertainment-driven, confused church. We have to rise up. If we do not rise up, nobody else will. Wow. And uh, will you tear down the altar of Moloch in your neighborhood? Because that's where it's at. We're that's competing right. every hour of every day with Planned Parenthood on the Internet. That's and right. We do it in New York, Los Angeles, Houston, Dallas, Miami, uh, the DMV area, and Chicago. Wow. Millions of dollars. We don't need, catch this, we don't need your money. You need to support us, though, because if we're hoping that this nation turns back and our hopes in politics, we're looking the wrong way. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That that's the power of God. We need the power of God in this cause space. And so we need you as a church to be clear about it, to drive your stake in the ground, to preach it to the people in your congregation. That's right. One out of every five visit women in your congregation has been touched by abortion, men too, and they need forgiven and set free. And so, you know, we need to rise to the occasion. And uh, it says in uh, Psalm 82, rescue, rescue those that are taking away to death and those who are staggering to the slaughter. Oh, hold them back. If you say we did not know that, don't know this, does not he know it? Who keeps your heart? Does he know it? Who keeps and watches your soul? And will he not run to each one of us according to our deeds? Wow. We're attacking the Imago Dei. They're attacking your daddy's image through abortion and transmania. This is our fight. This is the church's fight. This is a test. 
This That's isn't right. about America. This isn't about the election. This isn't about Trump. This isn't about any of that. This is about what is the church That's going right. to do? What's my church going to do? Rise up. And Seth has a great quote, which I can't do. Right. <laughs> if I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that one point at which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christianity. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proven. And to be steady on every other battlefield is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that one point. The blood-bought bride of Christ has been flinching at the one point at which the spirit of Moloch and Baal are manifesting in our cities. And if you think that this is not equivalent to child sacrifice, passing children through the fire in the Old Testament, I would suggest that you do not understand your Bible, Pastor. In Luke 1, when the prenatal John the Baptist leaps in the womb, did you know the Greek word for baby leaping in the womb is berephos? So then you turn to Luke 2. And it says, Mary laid baby Jesus in the manger. So this is an infant already born. It's the same Greek word for baby, berephos, because God sees no distinction in value, dignity, and a right to life between babies in the womb and babies outside the womb. And this is why I speak in churches with the white rose resistance all around the country to prick the conscience of God's people to be like Gideon in Judges 6 and walk out of the cave we've been hiding in and start actively tearing down the high places Amen. of child sacrifice in America. Welcome to a Kairos moment. Welcome to the fight for life. Roe v. Wade overturned was not the victory. It was actually just the beginning to Christian resistance in America. And we want to invite you to participate in that resistance with our organization, with Mission Preborn, with Reassemble, and with bold pregnancy center directors like Josh in Arizona. Guys, we'll see you on the battlefield. Go out there and give them heaven, will you?